Grace. I'm right here. I fucked up. I know. It's okay. It's not okay. Not even close. How'd you find me anyway? I ordered a deed of entitlement to issue to the Black Wolf. It came in yesterday, and Von Glauer's name was on it. I threatened Werner Huber's life unless he told me where you were. Yeah, well... Unfortunately, your cavalry arrived too late this time. Well, if you hadn't been such an idiot refusing to tell me where you were, I might have been able to save your little butt days ago. Well, maybe I'd rather have it chewed off than have to deal with your gloating. You ever think of that? Forget it. We have to deal with things the way they are. Do you remember what you kept talking about on the way over here? That vision of Ludwig? Yeah. Believe it or not, it may help us out. I'm gonna go check on some things. Mr. Smith will watch over you, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Burning up. It's good conditioning for hell. You're going to be fine. Not the hair, Grace. I don't want to disturb him. Grüß Gott, Frau Nakimura. Grüß Gott. Haben Sie etwas für mich? Nicht für Sie, aber für den Schattenjäger. For Gabriel. What is it? I'll take it to him. Ich bringe es zu ihm, okay? Yeah. Okay. It's a letter from Von Glauer. And he sent the Ritter talisman back, too. Gabriel, I know you are very ill right now. The change is always painful. I went through it myself when I was only 12, and I did not even know what was happening to me. I'm sorry I'm not there to help you, but I have a pretty clear sense that you would not welcome my presence. You are safe in Rittersburg. For now, that is enough. Let me speak then of the future. You hate me now. I know this, but I have some hope that by the pass of the second moon, when the sickness wanes and the blood has inflamed the greater part of you, you will see things differently. You will need me then, and I think you will want me then. It is for hope of this that I did not have you destroyed. 
the night you were bitten by Bonsell. I could have done. You were passed out for hours at the lodge. It would have been a simple thing to wake the men, show them Bonsell's corpse, and make up a story that would enrage them enough to kill you. I did not. Let that be proof of my true desire for friendship with you. I have desired companionship for more years than you have lived. I have even very rarely taken the risk and changed others. But the blood was always too much for the brain and my chosen one ended up dead. Or mad. This is why I started the Hunt Club. It was my idea that if I could first indoctrinate men's minds to the religion of tooth and claw, that they then might be prepared for the change. As you have seen, it did not work. Gonzalo was the best of the lot. If he had turned out well, I would have taken the others. But there is no point in even trying with them now. But you are different. You are a ritter. Your blood is already supernatural. Yes, I know of your family. I have studied much over these long years. When we met, I felt somehow that you would not be destroyed by the gift. You have an enormous streak of the beast in you. And you are innately strong in the occult. You will be powerful and beautiful in the change. I am sure of it. I did not intend for it to happen so soon and in such a way. But perhaps fate has its own reason. But how confused you must be. You may feel I used you to dispose of Montel. I did. He had to be taken care of and you obligingly showed up. What was I to do? I am too old not to have learned at least this much about the light. You cannot shut it out. Better to let it in and let it simply dim to adjust to the relative brightness inside. Think well on these things as your body adjusts. Think about meeting me in Munich in two months' time. We can leave Germany if you wish and go anywhere you like. I will teach you how to hunt, how to live safe and well. You can feel the night wind on your face, taste the heartbeat of the kill beneath your jaws. It is glorious. Much more so than the priestly lie the Schattenjäger offers. Don't confuse yourself with ideas of good and evil. Nature shows us that there are no such distinctions. You and I both inherited something from our fathers. Is your legacy any less of a curse or blessing than mine? Join me. Yours. Friedrich. Sit down, Grace. Gabriel seems awfully sick. Of course he does. His body's fighting that blood something fierce. You know, dear, I wouldn't count on Gabriel being pleasant or even cooperative. He is quite literally not himself. You think I shouldn't really let it bother me that he's being such a butthead? Well, don't worry, he's always like that. It will get worse. Do you think that we really need to keep him locked up in there? It seems so cruel. He'll be more at ease knowing he's locked up in there and can't harm anyone if he does change. I suppose so. His only chance now is the destruction of his maker. I know. Emil will watch over Gabriel in the dungeon? Yes, dear. Besides, you have other things to attend to, don't you? Yes, the opera. And the diagram, I have to get them. Do you think you'll be able to do that by yourself? Just watch me. 
Do you know anything about El Totting? Yes, it's a pilgrimage shrine. Emily and I have been there, but I didn't know about the hard urns at the time. It's one of those places that vibrates with spiritual energy. It's very strong. I think they had the first miracle in, oh, about the middle of the 1700s. But the Black Madonna herself is much older than that. There's something I think you should see. Oh, my. Has Gabriel seen this? No. Well, my dear, I understand your reluctance, but... It's his karma, you know? It's his choice. He's the son, you know, von Glauer. He's the son of von Rolick. Yes, I think you're right. And he wants Gabriel. So it seems. But that doesn't mean Gabriel wants that life. He didn't ask to be bitten. <sighs> you don't know him like I do. Running on all fours wouldn't be a big stretch. I won't tell you the choice will be an easy one. But it's a battle he must fight. All you can do is believe in him. That's all you can do. Now you be careful. I think I'll steal one of these rolls. Please do, dear. You're thin as a rail. <laughs> Werner looks about as interested in talking to me as I am in talking to him. How is Gabriel? Is he going to be all right? He'll be fine, Gerda. Let me know if I can help. Sure. Thanks. Grace Nakamura. Ed has offered to help, but I can't think of anything she can do at the moment.
That's all right. You're just going to help me out for a bit, and then you'll be free. Silver body parts, penitent offerings, a replica is made for the part of the body you wish to have healed. The replica is offered to the Lady of Altading as a token of faith. Scott, is it possible to see Ludwig's heart urn? Das tut mir leid. Das Herz für Ludwig des Feiter von Bayern? Haben Sie das Herz? Das Herz. Herz. Oh, no, not my heart. I'm not sick. Thanks. If you have a special prayer to make or wish to place a penitence offering, I can lead you to the shrine. Mary's water. It looks like they want a donation. Entschuldigen Sie bitte, die Kinder. Ich hole etwas, um es auszuwischen.
wie ist das Ding hier hereingekommen? I doubt there's anything left in there now. Silver Heart reminds me of the Silver Penitent gifts at Altadin. I wonder if... No, that wouldn't be right. Maybe I should just ask her. I wonder if... Gerda, I have something to ask you. It's really awful. What is it? You know the silver heart you got for Wolfgang's casket? Yes. If I paid you to have another one made, do you think I could take the one at St. George's? It's for Gabriel, isn't it? Yes. Take it. Wolfgang will understand. Thank you so much, Gerda.
Hello. Those look bad. Thanks, Gerda. I'm Wolfgang. Hello. I have a gift for the Madonna, Father. I think that door leads outside. Lady of Altoni, take this gift. I think you know why I'm here. I apologize for even thinking of violating your shrine. But you know I need to get what's inside Ludwig's urn. I think you want me to help him and Gabriel. Gabriel may be egotistical and selfish, but he's got a good heart, I think. Anyway, he doesn't deserve this curse. Help me help both of them. Please. I hope this works. I only have a few seconds.
The Curse of Engelhard by Richard Wagner Act 1 Many years ago in a small German village there lived a young man named Engelhard. Engelhard was a lowly blacksmith's apprentice. He was fair faced but by nature gentle and shy. Being orphaned and having lived with a blacksmith in virtual slavery since his parents died, Engelhard had nothing in the world to claim as his own. Nothing, that is, but an amazing talent. For ten years, the beautiful and much-desired wares that had passed for the blacksmith's own had actually been produced by Engelhart. The blacksmith, a greedy and vain man, was determined to keep this a secret. He forbade Engelhart to ever work the metal in front of another soul, on pain of death. But the blacksmith's ingratitude went further still. He was so plagued with envy of Engelhart's talents that he treated Engelhart like a lazy and worthless dog. The other villagers, assuming that the blacksmith's behavior toward Engelhardt must be deserved, followed suit. Now in the same town there lived a rich baron. The baron maintained a patronly and righteous face with the villagers, but it was rumored that he was actually unspeakably cruel and wicked. There was also a young maiden, Hildegunda, who was lovely and good-hearted. Hildegunda was the only one who took pity on Engelhardt and was kind to him. Engelhardt loved Hildegunda madly, but was too shy and too penniless to even speak of it. In the first act, we learn that Hildegunda's parents, blinded by the prospective fortune, have betrothed her to the Baron. When Hildegunda learns of this, she is terrified and protests that the Baron is reputed to be evil, but her parents brush this off as jealous rumors and demand her obedience. Poor Hildegunda is too good to defy her parents' wishes, and so she reluctantly agrees. The Baron, with great public ceremony, sends Hildegunda a betrothal gift of a silver jewelry box. Hildegunda, overcome by her fear and anger at the betrothal, casts the jewelry box into the fire. She is immediately remorseful and pulls it out, but it is too late. The delicate silver has been madly marred. Hildegunda fears for her life when she sees the damage. She is afraid the blacksmith would report the damage to the Baron, so she approaches Engelhart and begs him to help her. Engelhart thinks of his master's warning, but determines to disregard it for Hildegunda's sake. He melts down the silver and constructs another box even more beautiful than the first. When Hildegunda sees his great artistic skill, she falls in love with him. The two come together in an aria of love, but their bliss is momentary. What about the betrothal? The young couple, knowing the Baron will never relinquish his claim, decide to run away. Act 2. The Baron learns of Hildegunda and Engelhardt's disappearance. He is so furious that he hires hunters to track the pair down. Hildegunda and Engelhardt are found and arrested. In a public trial, Hildegunda pleads their case in a stirring aria. She tells the townspeople of Engelhardt's great skill and his mistreatment by the blacksmith. She tells them Engelhardt is good and kind. The blacksmith should be turned out for his evils and Engelhardt given the shop. Then she and Engelhardt could marry and live in peace with their neighbors. Her parents chose a groom for her, but she begs to be allowed her own choice. It is then the baron's turn to speak. He declares that he has been terribly injured, a victim of a wayward girl. His marriage claim was first. There can be no other. He implies that if the villagers do not help him make it right, he will remove his aid from the village coffers. Then the Baron turns to Engelhardt. By the rights of the injured, the Baron announces, he is empowered to set a curse. The oh. Baron curses Engelhardt with a terrible and ancient malady, that whenever the moon shines in the night, Engelhardt will become a marauding wolf. The village is terrified of wolves and has been plagued for many years by a local renegade wolf which has taken the lives of many children. The Baron further declares that because he is merciful, he will still marry Hildegunda, but not until she renounces Engelhard with her own words. Until she does, he will keep her safe from further shame by locking her up in a small room at the top of his house. The villagers naturally side with the Baron. Hildegunda goes to her prison, and Engelhardt does indeed become a wolf at night. At first, Engelhardt is hated and feared by the villagers. They make the sign of the evil eye at him and will not tolerate his presence in town. But soon, rumors start to circulate about Engelhardt the wolf. It seems he is always careful not to harm any human being nor any domestic stock. In fact, he even does some good for the villagers. 
He scares away bandits and he keeps the renegade wolf at bay. No more children are lost to the fangs of the night. Engelhardt's kindness shines through even the dire nature of his curse. Hilda Gunda, meanwhile, still loves Engelhardt as much as ever, whatever curse he might be under, and whatever acts that curse might force him to commit. When she hears of Engelhardt's successful mastery of the curse, she dedicates herself to him forever. Hilda Gunda tells the Baron that she will never renounce Engelhardt. The Baron's plan having collapsed before him, having given Engelhardt dignity rather than removed it, he flies into a rage. He tells Hildegunda that he will marry her anyway, and on the morrow at that. She will become his wife or her parents' life will be forfeit. Act 3. The final act begins with the wedding feast for Hildegunda and the Baron. Hildegunda has cooperated due to her fear for her parents' lives, but now that the service is over, she is horrified to find herself that Baron's wife and is mourning her final separation from Engelhardt. After her poignant opening aria, the Baron approaches her and tries to draw her back to the party. He calls for the entertainment, hoping to cheer her up. In strides a traveling show of minstrels. They wear comic costumes and full face paint and immediately proceed to play and juggle for the crowd. One of them, a mime with a tragic frown painted on his face, seems to want to hover near and amuse the bride. She keeps brushing him off, clearly depressed and tearful, and he does his best to make her laugh. After the amusing antics of the minstrel's first song, the tone changes and the minstrel's music grows dark and theatrical. The Baron protests, preferring the comedy, but he's reassured by Hildegunda's father. The minstrels gather in a circle around the frowning minstrel. They whirl around him, and he slowly sinks from sight. The music grows more frantic. Suddenly, the minstrels burst apart like petals, and standing in the center of the room is... a wolf. The villagers scream, but Hildegunda cries out that it is Engelhart. The wolf does not attack the crowd. It only lifts its head and begins to howl. The Baron screams at the wolf to stop, and he screams at the villagers to kill the wolf, but they only stare in horror. The Baron pulls his hair and gnashes his teeth. He rises and makes it to the center of the banquet hall, where he falls down in a heap of wedding silk. What emerges from the silk is another wolf. Engelhardt has revealed the Baron's terrible secret for all to see. He was the renegade wolf that had terrorized the village. The Baron Wolf escapes from the hall through the main archway. Engelhardt leaps after him. The villagers rally in a cry of horror and fury. One of the men grabs an axe from the wall and entreats the others to follow. They will stalk and kill the murderous wolf. The villagers storm through the archway. Hildegunda follows. The final scene takes place in the woods outside the village. The villagers hunt the two wolves. They follow the wolf tracks, singing of the apparent ferocity of the battle between the two wolves. Hildegunda answers the men's excitement with her own fear for Engelhardt's life. The crowd emerges into a clearing. There, the two wolves are engaged in a final deadly embrace. As they watch, Engelhardt triumphs and the barren wolf sinks to the ground and dies. Unfortunately, Engelhardt is mortally wounded. His curse has been broken by the baron's death, but it is too late. Hildegunda sings her love to him, while the villagers pronounce him a great hero. Engelhardt dies, and all mourn in a sorrowful final aria. We have one hour, people. Hey, Emmerding. Hey, Emmerding. Yes, Mr. Costello? Hey, Emmerding, I must again protest about my lack of vocalization in Act Three. I have not a single note until the transformation aria. Now, how many times do we have to go over this? You are disguised as a silent minstrel. I know that. But an aria sung to the audience, off to one side, would be very effective. Hildegund has one. Yes, but the audience is not supposed to know it's you until the transformation into a wolf. It's a surprise. You know, surprise. I realize that's the way it's written. I simply disagree with its effectiveness. Your opinion is noted. Ah, it's time to get ready, Georg. You go. I, uh, 
I want to go over this one more time. How's the installation going? All right. Will the last one be up soon? Yeah, soon. How are you holding up, Georg? Oh, man. I'm going crazy. I wish I had never blackmailed Klaus into letting me conduct. Don't be ridiculous. The opera was your discovery, Georg, remember? You'll be famous after tonight. Assuming I don't make a complete ass of myself. I'm not sure what else to say to Georg. I'm not sure. Here's that list I made. I suppose that large X had something to do with the seating arrangements. It's in a nice line from the chandeliers. A seating chart. This might be useful. The large X on Wagner's diagram is in an area called the Mittel Loge on the seating chart. I'd better check it out. How do you feel? Like someone's put broken glass in my brain. I thought we'd have you back in Rittersburg by now. The Smiths are waiting for you there. It's okay. Just stick me in a room somewhere. Are we ready for the test? I'll check. Could you see about some heat, Gracie? I'm really freezing in here. Are you cold? Sure. It's cold. I'll see what I can do. I'm good. You do that.
I should let him rest. Herr Silbermeier, I know you're working as fast as you can, but we're opening in less than an hour. I really need to run through some music once you're done. Fire music. They will not fall down. I'm sure they won't, but uh, look, you told me they'd be done by noon. Well, you are lucky that we could even make them in so little time. And then we drive them here special this morning. I know that. I know. You've been great. It's just... Is everything at least going according to the diagram? Yeah, we make it work. What do you mean, we make it work? <laughs> this diagram is not so good. Uh, we make changes, yeah? Oh, my God. Look, there weren't supposed to be changes. I told you to follow the diagram exactly. <laughs> Maybe in 1945 we follow diagram exactly. But today, we make changes. <laughs> what are you saying? These measurements are not the same as today. Now, if we make the chandeliers the same distance from each other, just as marked, but the distance from chandeliers to the walls, no, not the same. Why aren't the measurements the same? This is the Wittelbacher Theater, isn't it? Yeah, but not the same Wittelsbacher Theater. The bombs hit the first one. This one is very close, but smaller. But everything looks so old. Oh, they take the art and the wood and save it. Remake theater later, after the war. Of course. Of course. How could I be so stupid? I'm a history major. Oh, it's okay. The chandeliers work good. Same distance from each other, but just not to walls. Yes. I'm sure you've done your best. Thank you. There's nothing else I can say to him that will make any difference now. Georg, I need you to promise me something. What? There may be some distractions tonight in the audience in Act 3. I need you to keep playing no matter what. What distractions? What are you saying? Don't get upset. It's just, well... It is opening night. The audience might be a bit rowdy, you know? Are you serious? But we have extra security lined up, so if anything were to happen, it would be taken care of. So just, you know, keep playing. Grace, I, I do not even want to know what you are talking about. This is a brand new Wagner opera. I am not going to stop the performance, even if, if Wagner himself comes floating out on stage. Great. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. This is definitely the Mythologe. According to Wagner, von Glauer gets seated here. Lieber too. Now I just need to find a way to block the doors.
is working for some reason. There we go. How quaint. These little latches hold the doors open. Cool air is coming in through that vent. It Maybe I should see what's in there before I lock it. Grace Knock. That rope might come in handy. Oops. That might work, but I'll have to wait until Von Glauer's in here. Paul. Yeah? You're going to see two special invitations tonight. One is addressed to a man named Baron Von Glauer, the other is Commissar Lieber. Both will be seated in the Mitteloja. 
I have it marked here. No problem. Oh, and when Commissar Lieber arrives, please find me. I need to speak with him before he's seated. Yes, Van Akimura. Is it time for the test yet? No. Don't you worry about that. Everything will be fine. You'll see. I should let him rest. Looks like I found a spotlight, and one that's not often used by the look of it. There's the hot seat. Perfect. Excuse me, Frau Nakimura. Yes. Time to open the doors. So soon? We're not ready. The performance starts in 15 minutes. The people have been waiting outside for over an hour. All right, just give me five minutes, OK? <sighs> OK. The doors will open in five minutes. No, we don't have time. I found a safe place for you downstairs. You'll be all right there. But to test. It's too late to change anything now, even if we could test it. Come on. Does it lock? Plug your ears and you probably won't feel a thing. I still wish we tested it. We're not going to get another shot, Gracie. 
Just rest. I'll see you later. Gabriel? What? I have to tell you something. I screwed up. What are you talking about, Gracie? The chandelier foreman had to change the measurements. It's the theater. It's not the same Wittelbacher theater. It's been rebuilt, and this one is smaller. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the crystals will work. I can't believe you did this. God damn you, Gracie! You did it on purpose, didn't you? Gabriel! Open the door! Open the goddamn door! No. You open the door this minute. If you can't manage a simple goddamn fucking diagram, I'll take care of things myself! Myself, do you hear me? Open it! I'm sorry. I'll do the best I can. Gracie! Gracie! Commissar Lieber, at your service. I'm one of the show's producers, Herr Lieber. Thank you so much for helping us out this evening. You came with another officer, and you came armed. Is that correct? Just as the invitation specified. But why did you ask me? The Ordnungspolizei usually supply extra security. One of our producers is a fan of yours. We needed the extra security, and he wanted to make sure you got good seats for tonight's performance. Oh, they are very good seats, very generous. But... Is there some specific trouble you're expecting this evening? Believe me when I say that nothing at all will probably happen. I hope you are right. I would like to meet this van after the performance. I hope that will be possible, Commissar. Thank you again. My pleasure. Von Glauer should be in there by now, but I can't see much from here.
That roll of tape might be useful. No point in putting on makeup with these jeans.
shoot! Let him go! Let him go. Going back to school soon. It's all arranged. Don't do that. You didn't even want me on this case. It came up so quickly. <sighs> Give me a break. Fine, I wanted you safe in America, so sue me. It won't happen again. It won't. What's Von Glauer really like? I liked him. Haven't you ever wished you could just follow your instincts? Live for the moment? Yes. That was Von Glauer. Von Glauer? Was that pit of bodies? Ludwig's suicide. There's always a price, Gabriel. Don't you know that by now? I made my choice, Gracie. So you did. Do you know why? I guess when it comes right down to where the buck stops, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like that, Gracie. They won't stop testing you, you know. It'll get easier, though. Don't you think, Gracie? 